Good evening. Welcome to SIU AA Level. It's of course week 20. Well, week 20, no, week 101. But of course, lesson 20. And this, of course, I'm going to complete the, this 20 lesson series on misinterpreted scriptures. We didn't cover everything I need to cover because in my next lesson, I'm going to begin to show you some things about the rapture. It took me about 20 weeks just to do this. And so I'm going to complete it and touch on some things I want you to see more clearer. Some things that I think you just need to see as I explain to you about misinterpreted scriptures. And basically, we actually suffer from a lack of hermeneutics, uh, hermeneutics training, which is the science and the interpretation of scripture and understanding how to interpret scripture according to the season or the age that the scriptures are written to. Hello, Jimmy Simon. God bless you, Ellis. And a lot of times we try to take the Bible, which is an Eastern book, and try to retrospect it and fit it into Western culture America. But really, Western culture America is supposed to take principles from the Bible and apply it to today's culture. But there are certain things in the biblical script that were directly directed to first century Israel. And in order to discern the word of God, you got to have some training and some equipping and some developing or if not, you would think you're still Jewish, you got to wear a robe, you got to meet on Saturday, you got to go to the Jewish temple. <laughs> you got to find a priest, you got to find a high priest, you got to bring an offering, you got to uh, don't worship on the Sabbath. We start mixing a lot of things into it, into it that has nothing to do with it. So tonight, I'm going to drive home tonight on Lesson 20. This is week 101. This is the AA level on misinterpreted scriptures. And I'm going to show you tonight. Something I believe that the body of Christ have missed and we don't talk about it. And I keep saying this over and over and please hear this closely. There are a few things that Israel worshipped. Three things, all right? The temple, the city of Jerusalem, and the state of Israel, which is also called Canaan in the Bible. The state, the city, and the temple. Please write that down. The temple the city and the state okay and to them that was their heaven on earth I want you to hear me closely to them that was their heaven and their earth and they also saw themselves as the sun the moon and the stars which represented places of high authority that means when God is going to deal with anything in the earth he must come through the Jewish people today they call that Zionism which is quite biblical in a sense, because God always have to have a people to flow through to go through. Okay, now I'm going to begin to sum, sum, I'm going to, I'm going to sum up about 20 weeks tonight. The biggest problem with first century Israel is that they took something that was temporary or subject to grow and try to make it permanent. They tried to take this as a week uh, 101 and lesson 20. Thank you. Week 101, lesson 20. I misinterpreted scripture. Thank you, President CBJ. Hello, Abraham Harrison. God bless you. Hello, Jimmy Salmon. God bless you. Hello, uh, Tamia Charlotte Jones. God bless you. Hello, Andrea Playwell, Playwright Carr. And to all of my students, it's prayerfully to hope tonight you guys will sow seed into your tuition. And those who are watching or visiting will take opportunity to sow seed tonight. So, that has to be established. I've been trying to establish that truth for a long time. Uh, that Dagon Temple and that city of Jerusalem, which is actually the size of New Jersey, Hello, Shakia McDuffie, uh, granddad, I mean, uh, my, my, my father, which will also be your uncle, Uncle Ike, is, I had a little miracle tonight. His eyes were opening by themselves. When the doctor came in to tap his eyes, he's, he's, not, he's moving his eyes on his own. It's not a reflex. He's opening his eyes on his own. So that's a miracle for me. So let's continue to keep Ike McDuffie in commandment, commanding him to awaken. Okay? And I can get, I'm going to stay in my lesson tonight. So first century Israel was always interested in, of course, the temple, the city, and the state of Canaan, which they call it the state of Israel. And um, when you get to the book of Joshua, it was told that Canaan would be their state land. And inside of Canaan would be a capital city called Jerusalem. Jerusalem. And inside Jerusalem is the United States of America. Time for another teaching for that. And of course, you have, of course, the temple, the tabernacle, the place where the Ark of the Covenant was laid. And if Israel had God for their God and Israel was their nation in the first century Israel mind, 
This is all they needed. They wanted God to themselves, themselves to God. They got the temple of the tabernacle. And then they got the city of Jerusalem and the state of Israel, which is called Canaan. And you'll find a whole Old Testament teaching surrounded around these three things. But here was the problem, which is also the problem with today's American church. You try to limit God. God does things line upon line and precept upon precept. There's no such thing as Jewish replacement. It's called Jewish improvement. God wants to build on top of something because he's reaching for something greater. He always wanted the first century Israel to be the evangelistic arm to the surrounding nations because Satan had them in a spirit of deception. He deceived all the nations, but God set aside Israel for himself. And by only by the mercy and grace of God, some were able to call strangers of the promises. They were attached to Israel. Some had favor with some people. It wasn't part of Israel and joined on the Israel. But most of the nations were deceived by the power of Satan. All right. But when the gospel of the kingdom comes on the scene, Satan can no longer keep anyone from receiving Christ as their Savior and their Lord. He no longer has the power to deceive the nations because an angel in the book of Revelations bind the devil. And bind does not mean totally shut down. It means to restrict, to spoil, to not have the power you used to have. And so what you're going to find out from the Old Testament right up to the New Testament that God was always attempting to keep a people for himself that would obey him. But the promise had always been that the anointing would go from Abraham's seed to be a blessing to the whole world, the whole nation, not just to Israel. But Tisha Charles, Jose, this image for you, Sam, uh, they kind of became self-centered and quite selfish. And they even tried to turn the temple into their own game room. Uh, they sold uh, things in the temple they weren't supposed to. They sold sacrifices. They gave out loans from the treasury and added a 30% interest rate to it. Uh, they were also murdering in the temple. Uh, buying means to tie up. Thank you. You know, so it doesn't always mean because something is uh, buying that you totally stop stuff. You tie it up and you limit it. Okay. So the power you used to have, you have it no more. So uh, my wife and I leave our apartment at times and there are times we have two of our favorite dogs with us and one we tie up, we bind up. It doesn't mean that the dog does not have total immobilization. He's allowed, she's allowed to walk around in the cage, but she's limited. So when you use the term bind, it means to restrict. Very important point to understand that because we can, when we get to the book of Revelation, I'm going to break down to you about we bound the dragon for a thousand years. You're going to have a whole other perspective on that when I get to this teaching. But I'm laying a foundation. So Israel did not con complete the whole program. And God was laying something out because a Savior would come, the Messiah. You know, that is the problem. But the problem was, Jose, the problem was, President CBJ, is that they did not like the Messiah that God sent. He sent one that didn't carry a bomb or a gun or an arrow or a rock or a bullet or a nuclear weapon. He came with a weapon of righteousness and a weapon of love. And that was something that Jews couldn't get with in that age. And so they actually rejected Jesus. All right. And due to their rejection, and I don't think it was that only rejection, it was what they was doing in the midst of the rejection, murdering. And then they would real be real religious and sanctimonious and then tell the people they were keeping the Torah and then put extra weight on the other Jews to keep the Torah when them themselves wasn't keeping it. And if anybody came to try to correct them, they would murder them and then quote from the Torah they was justified in doing it. So when Christ Jesus comes on the scene and uh, uh, they actually murdered him and knew they would murder him. And then Jesus pronounced judgment and said, all right, I'm going to say it again, said that uh, surely your house will be laid desolate. And this will happen in this generation, which means within a 40 year period. OK, and this is very important. If you go to Luke chapter 21, go there real quick. I'm going to sum this up. I'm going to get to something next next time.
topic, but I got to see this one more time. In Luke chapter 21, it says in verse 1, as he looked up, Jesus saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow putting in two very small copper coins. And he says, I tell you the truth, he said, this poor widow has put in more than all of the others. All these people give their gifts out of their wealth, but she out of her poverty put in all she had to live on. Verse 5, some of the disciples were remarking about how the temple was adorned with beautiful stones and with gifts dedicated to God. So there was interest in the physical build. Hello, Marion Jones. There was interest in the building, interested in how the stained glass windows were. There was interest in how, how big the city was because actually the temple was like a mini city. And they said that city is where God dwells. It was the house that God dwells. God turned a house into the home. And they built this with their hands. And they called this the Herodian Temple. And they put billions of dollars into this 40 to 42 acre size temple. 40 to 42 acres. That's the size of a mall. Maybe the Westfield Mall. I don't know. I got to do some real comparison. But, and they counted this to be the place where God dwelled. But when you listen to the words of Jesus, he said, you folks are like devils, sons of hell. He was talking to the mostly the Pharisees, the scribes, and even point out some of the Sadducees. And these were supposed to be the leaders of Israel, but that became so corrupted and perverted. And it was no longer keeping the Torah, but telling folks they were. And so they was braggadocious about this temple that they were building. But then Jesus says to them in Luke 21, verse 5, some of the disciples were remarking about how the temple was adorned with beautiful stones and with gifts dedicated to God. But Jesus said, as for what you see here, the time will come when not one stone will be left on another. Every one of them will be thrown down. And in verse 7, teach today as when will these things happen and what will be the sign that they are about to take place? So I already established you there's nothing to do with the rapture. Nothing to do with 2,000 years later. He's talking to a present Jewish audience who is kissing the temple, have a lot of money to build the temple, but you got a poor widow sitting right next to you you can't even give a $20 bill to. That's when they was in love with the love of money. The love of money is the root of all evil. And so what is so deep about this whole thing is that he's really calling out the spirit of covetousness. And you bragging about how big the temple is, how beautiful the stones, that a widow woman who lost her husband, she's a widow, you guys can't even give her a $1,000 to help her with her rent, her mortgage. You can't even help her. But y'all running down and competing. I give a million to the temple. I buy that stone. I put this stone in. And you're competing over who gives the most money, who's the most rich. And Jesus says, all this emphasis y'all putting on this temple is it's going to be torn down. <laughs> Now, when you hear that today, it don't mean nothing to you because you're an American. But in first century Israel, the temple, the city, and the state of Israel, or Canaan, means everything to them. Uh, to them, the state of Israel, the city, and the temple is like Super Bowl in America. It means everybody wants to be a part of it because that's supposed to be the place where the Messiah comes and delivers Israel from the hand of the Romans. But in Christ's mind, he had a whole nother kingdom in mind, and they did not want to embrace this kingdom. And keep this in mind, they knew he was the Messiah, but they did not want to relinquish power, did not want to relinquish authority. And what they do back then is what we do now in America. If someone comes and going to shake up your power and cause people to lose votes or they're going to lose people, they will kill you. That they may not shoot you or blow you up. They will kill you with their mouth and they'll kill you with your got with the gossip. Because they don't like the influential power that keeps them from ruling people's minds. Listen to me, Tisha Charles and Jose Morales and President Crystal and Lolita, my cousin, and Marion Jones. There is something that doesn't like it when you're preaching the truth and that truth dismantles the powers that be. So when you read Luke 21. He begins to give them signs and things leading up to the time when there will be, of course, a tearing down of the temple. 
Everything is focused on the temple. Look at Luke 21, verse 20. I'm going through this quick. I want to get some play. I'm, I'm going to make it so plain tonight. How that temple was so important and how we, the church, have not taught this in our local churches. So we take these stories and we make them sound like America or Russia. The Pope is the devil and we don't know how to exegete the text or we don't understand the science of hermeneutics, which is hermeneutics. Uh, which is the interpretation of the uh, the science of the interpretation of scripture. And if you don't understand that science of interpreting scripture, you will think that the Bible is an American book. The Bible is an Eastern book. We as Americans need to take the principles from it and apply it to us indirectly. But there's some things that does not belong to us today because we're not first century Israel. We are now the Israel of God, which includes Jews and Gentiles who give their lives to Christ Jesus. And so you're going to see there's a major change. Now watch this. I'm going to show you something. You look at 21. The only thing they're asking about, well, when are you going to, when is the timber going to be thrown down? And what will be the signs of it about to happen? And so this has to happen. Look at Luke 21. All right, and go to verse 32. Now, I'm making this plain because this is, this, is, this is lesson 20. And I'm kind of summing stuff up so you can kind of teach this to people. It says this, I tell you the truth, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away but my words will never pass away. Now, when you're American, you hear heaven and earth, you think the real heaven and the real earth is passing away. That is not a proper exegeting of the text. Because if you read the Bible, you will notice that the heaven and earth never passes away. Never. So when he uses the term heaven and earth right here, it's symbolic of how Jews think in that day. Their heaven is the temple. Their earth is the city of Jerusalem and the state of Israel, which means that even though this city or this temple will be torn and thrown down, what I'm saying to you has more weight. Believe what I'm saying to you versus worshiping a physical building. This temple is corrupted. It is perverted. It is twisted. And God is going to visit judgment on it. And by the mercy of God, I'm giving you warning signs. So when the time comes close, you can hit the road, Jack, and don't come back no more, no more, no more, no more. Hit the road, Jack. Don't you come back no more. Which when you see these signs, run, run, run. All right. And that's the thing I want to make plain here. All right. When you look at this, start up at verse 20. When you see Jerusalem being surrounded by armies, are you listen to me. OK, this has nothing to do with the United States of America, Russia, uh, the Pope is the false beast. I, nothing, nothing. I got to say that over and over because I get inbox questions all the time. When you see Jerusalem being surrounded by armies, you will know that its desolation is near. That means whatever Jesus is saying, it has to be, happen in the immediate nearby future, not something 2,000 years later. So this kills a lot of the movies you watch. This kills a lot of the book deals you read about the rapture into the world because this scripture has to do with first century Israel who was alive at the time that Jesus Christ is walking on the planet. Because I already showed you in verse 32, it has to happen to this generation. And run, yes to me, a run. And this generation is 40 years. A generation is the big four and zero. Back up to verse 20. When you see Jerusalem being surrounded by armies, you will know that its desolation is near. And then he says, 21 then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those in the city, what city? Jerusalem, Jerusalem, get out, run forest, and let those in the country, which may be out in the state of Israel area, high up in the mountains, don't go into the city of Jerusalem. For this is the time of punishment and fulfillment of all that has been written. So Jesus is saying, whatever the Jews did, 
Listen, from Abel up to this 40-year period, God is going to pour out his wrath. Now, I got to say that. I know some folks like to preach a nice, cute grace message, but that's not biblical. That's just your opinion, but it's not biblical. God is visiting judgment on a situation that deserved judgment. God brings judgment is a righteous judgment. Okay, he is love, but he's also a judge. Don't let folks trick you by your opinions and fictional teachings. Always go back to the Bible and base it on biblical teachings. This will keep you a great teacher. Okay, sometimes we got fictional writers and fictional preachers. They're not based on scripture. They're based on their feelings, how they grew up. And I appreciate fictional writers because I read books that are fictional, which comes from the word fake. So every book you read is not real, but the word of God is the truth. It's the real deal. So when you got to measure what I'm teaching up against someone's opinion and fictional saying, it's cute because make your feelings feel good. But God has the judgment side and God has a loving mercy side. He is a loving, merciful father, but he's also a very judgment judge when the time is right. And it takes a long time for God to get to a point where he starts to destroy and turn things upside down. And so what he's saying is I'm pronouncing judgment on the very city that had became like Babylon. He calls his own city like Babylon has fallen. He's talking to his own people, his own temple, his own city, his own people. That's supposed to be the heaven on the earth. They represent the sun, the moon, the stars. The sun is the male leadership. The moon is the woman's leadership. The stars are the fellow brothers and sisters. They are high and lifted up. And this will be God's called out warriors. But Israel was a whoring after other gods. And they were murdering in the temple. There was worse than some of the pagans. Let's stay, stay with me. This is Luke 21, verse 22. For this is the time of punishment and fulfillment of all that has been written. Now, look at verse 23. This is a shocking thing. I continue to point this out, Christina Mason and Tamia and Yvonne Stevens. How dreadful it would be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Now, someone said, this is the rapture. The church won't be here. That's not what he's talking about. <laughs> he's talking to first century Israel and he's talking to his disciples that ask him a question. When will this happen when the temple will be torn down? So Jesus Christ takes a whole chapter to explain the signs of his coming. So you think of coming, you think of rapture, going to take off to go to heaven forever. But God used the term coming a little bit different. He's coming in the clouds. He's coming to judge He's going to judge his own people, his own temple, his own city, and he's going to have it come to the ground. While another Israel rises up called the Israel of God, which is really the born again Jews and Gentiles who chase after Jesus. And the temple that we're building is not visible, it's invisible. And we dwell on Mount Zion now by faith. We become the royal priesthood. We become the lively stones, not the cement stones. We are movable, we're mobile, and what happens if you join a ministry, you join a man of God to coach you in ministries, wherever the man or woman of God go, you stay attached to their skirt, not particularly to the cement block building. Are you with me so far? Hello, Nero. Verse 23, how dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Look at this, y'all. This is deep. There will be great distress. I'm in Luke 21, verse 23. Luke 21, 23. I'm reading out the Living Insight Study Bible by Charles Swindoll. Great translation. Okay? He says, there will be great... This is verse 23 of Luke 21. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Which means that it will be a mistake or because it will be bad for you if you're pregnant or you just had a baby. Because you're going to have to run while you're pregnant. And while you're giving your baby breast milk, you may have to take off and run. He said, it's not smart to be pregnant at this time. I can't even believe this prophecy Jesus is giving because it's so specific. There will be great distress in the land and wrath against this people. Verse 24. They will fall by the sword and will be taken as prisoners to all the nations. Read your Bible. Jerusalem will be, be, will be stepped on top of 
by the Gentiles. Until when, Reverend McDuffie? Until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. So this makes my point very clear. So you can challenge me if you want about the scripture, but it's pretty clear that the anger of God is against Jerusalem and against his people because of the way they were running the temple and running the city. So Jesus says they're going to be major judgment because the Father is going to pull out his wrath and at the same time make a way of escape. I'm going to give you an interpretation of a rapture you probably never heard before. He's going to tell you how to escape this judgment. When you see them surrounding the city, run. That is your rapture. That's the rapture. When you see the Gentiles, which really are the Romans, you read this in the Roman Wars, you'll see around 66 AD, the 70, four years of war. And Jews die like Someone said over a million died. Blood was every place. And they couldn't eat. They were starving and eating their kids inside the temple because they thought God was fighting for them. But it was not God fighting for them this time. God was judging them through the Roman armies. And they tore the temple down. Not one brick left on top of another. The only thing that was left was, a, was an outside gate, which we go to Jerusalem every year called the Welling Wall. Everything else was torn down to the ground, which means Christ Jesus' prophecy came to pass within 40 years. All right, now, let me continue to read 24 of Luke 21. It says, and let me back up to 23 again, how dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. There will be great distress in the land and wrath against this people. They will fall by the sword and will be taken as prisoners to all nations. Jerusalem will be trampled or stepped on top of by the Gentiles until when? Until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Look at the signs that uh, that Jesus gave. And you got to think in terms of symbolism. Don't take everything literal. There will be signs in the sun moon, and stars. Go back to Genesis 37 and 39. I don't have time to read it. Job's had a dream. He said the sun, moon, and stars bow down at him. His Jewish dad said, you trying to say your father and your mom and your brothers are going to bow down at you? So when they heard sun, moon, and stars, they don't hear it the same way we hear it. They don't hear it the same way we hear it. They look at sun, moon, and stars as a symbolism of the leadership of Israel. He said there will be signs in Jewish leadership. On the earth, which we often mean generation, nations will be in anguish and perplexly at the roaring and the tossing of the sea, which means this represents there's going to be mass confusion. Men will faint from terror, apprehensive of what is coming on the world, for their heavenly bodies will be shaken. He's shaking up Israel. He's shaking up the leadership. There's a major transformation taking place. At that time, they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and with great glory. When these things begin to take place, stand up and lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing nigh. Now, when you hear that word redemption drawing nigh, folks, there's your rapture. We're about to leave the earth. We're about to take off, you know, or we in heaven and, and the, God is pouring out the plagues on everybody and the churches in heaven getting the reward. No, it's not. Read the Bible. Read it. That's not true. That's not true. You have to read it. Which means that when they start to see these things happening, the Israel that's serving Christ will say, every word that Jesus say is coming to pass. Now, when the Israel of God that's serving Christ is being persecuted by the first century Israel trying to stone them, kill them, and murder them, when they finally get to see that this prophecy Jesus say come to pass, the church says, wow, Christ is real, which means God is going to pay back those that martyred a lot of the Christian Jewish believers at that time. That's the redemption. The old system is becoming weaker and going to die out. And the new system, which is called the upgrade, is coming in. So the book of Acts is the story of the kingdom that's coming through the ecclesia, which I call the Israel of God, which the Jews and Gentiles together under Christ, and they're ascending into greater, like the kingdom of David, and the kingdom of Saul is decreasing and going down. 
when they finally get to see that the city was torn down. Now, you know, go watch how deep this is. The church or Israel that took heed to Christ's word, who ran out the city, got out the state, and started preaching the gospel around the world. When they saw what happened to Jerusalem, they said, but there is our redemption. Everything Jesus said to pass. Oh, well. And they kept on preaching the gospel because now the kingdom of Christ Jesus is in full flow. The book of Hebrews explains there's a taking away of one and a coming in of another. All right. And at the time the book of Hebrews is written, the Christian Jews were being persecuted by the Jews of the first century. And how they persecuted, they stoned them, they tried to kill them. That's why when I look at Acts 7, Acts 8, and Acts 9, I hope I'll get to that tonight, i show you how uh, Saul was the main persecutor of the church. And so Jesus warned you that you'll be arrested and thrown in jail. If you back up uh, to Luke 21 and look at verse, tw verse 12, but before all this, they will lay hands on you and persecute you. They will, they will deliver you to the synagogues and prisons. And you will be brought before kings and governors all on my account for my name. This will result in you being witnesses to them. But make up your mind not to worry beforehand how you will defend yourself. For I will give you words and wisdom that none of your adversaries will be able to resist or contradict. That's Stephen. Deacon Stephen in Acts 7 was the one they couldn't take his wisdom, all right? And God put it in his mouth to speak the word. He died a martyr. He, he received his calling and died a martyr. But in his martyrdom, it set the stage for Saul to become the apostle Paul. So we had the old Jewish movement trying to kill and murder the upgraded Jewish movement. You had civil war in the same camp. And the problem was that the gospel of Christ Jesus was going into the temple trying to preach to the Jews who thought that Jesus Christ was dead and gone. And Peter and John kept showing up and saying, no, he's not dead and gone. He's much alive. He's living in us and he's seated next to God the Father and we are the ecclesia. And we're here to let you know the man that you, got, that you guys murdered, he's still alive. You need to give your life to Christ so you can receive forgiveness. And the old move will put their hands in their ears and say, we don't want that Messiah. Kill him, kill him. And they will stone him and martyr them. And so the Christian was praying for God to deliver them from the spirit of martyrdom. Deliver us from those who, who kill innocent Christian believers. And so there was a time when martyrdom was high, but God began to de decrease it as God began to bring judgment against first century Israel. Okay? Stick with me. Back to Luke 21. And it says this. It says, watch this. Verse 29 of Luke 21. He told them this parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. When they sprout leaves, you can see for yourself and know that summer is near. Now, let me once again destroy the teaching of whatever Jesus is saying has to do with America 2,000 years later. He cannot quote this portion of the scripture and refer to something 2,000 years later. There's some folks who are so uh, trapped by the denomination and teachings no matter what you say to them, they're going to believe what they want to believe. But all you got to do is read the scripture because he's saying something has to be in, in, in imminent. Am I saying that word right? In, 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 imminent, when you when you close up, something's real near, something is approaching. Something is coming up close because he mentions here in verse 26, verse 29, he told them this parable, look at the fig tree. Now, when you look at the fig tree, fig tree 99% of the time speaks to Israel's leadership. That's why when Christ came to the fig tree, had leaves on it and no fruit, it represented the religious order of the day. A lot of leaves, but no productivity, which means you're about to leave, <laughs> right? Because I'm going to get fruit and there's no fruit on the tree. You're not producing, you're religious. You ever know folks who are religious? They attend all the services, but there's no fruit, there's no anointing. Some of the meanest ushers and the meanest church folk going to meet are folk who never miss church. So if you wish to God, some folks would stay home because they mean and nasty. You got to have fruit under the leaves. And the fig tree represents Israel's leadership. But then Jesus told the tree, no man eat from you any further, which is called a curse. 24 hours later, 
the 20 foot tree, nine, 10 foot wide tree, roots are outside the ground and the tree became a mountain of dirt. So it went from a tree to a mountain. And Jesus said, if you believe and know down your heart, you can say that the mountain be removed because the biggest problem was the temple on top of the mountain blocking everything. I got to remove the infection. Pick it up and have it removed, not move as Pastor Marcus would say, but remove as never to be rebuilt again, at least not in God's, not in God's plan. You might do some stuff, but it's not God's plan. So when you look at verse 29, he told them this parable, look at the fig tree and all the trees. When they sprout leaves, you can see for yourself that summer is near. Now watch this. Even so... When you see these things happening, you know that the kingdom of God is near. So all these things he's mentioning, you're going to know that the kingdom of God is nearby. The kingdom of God is flourishing. When you start to see these signs, be aware. Look around and say, the kingdom of Christ is near. Be near. Because at the same time as souls are being saved and coming to the kingdom of God through this body of Israel towards God that serves Christ Jesus, at the same time, judgment is being dealt to first century Israel and it's going on at the same time but every time you see these prophecies come to pass it should encourage your faith that God is fighting on your behalf and you're watching SITU AA level misinterpreted scripture this is of course uh, week I think one on, is it week one on one or week 100 let me just get this straight this is week uh, I think it's week 101 but less than 20 are misinterpreted scriptures. Either it's week 101 or 100, uh, present Christian, let me know again. And look at verse 32. I tell you the truth. This generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. All right? Be careful or your hearts will be weighed down with dissipation, drunkenness, and anxieties of life. And that day will close on you unexpected like a trap, but will come upon all those who live on the face of the whole earth. Be always on the watch and pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen and that you may be the stand. See, it is possible to escape this judgment within 40 years if you take heed to the warning. Now, let me give you an indirect truth here. A lot of times when men and women give you warnings and tell you to change your life or make some changes or return to church, join your leader, submit yourself, they're giving you a prophetic warning. But people don't listen. They don't listen until it's too late. Just like you told the folk, get on the boat, it's going to rain. Get on the ark, it's going to rain. It's possible that Noah preached probably 120 years and only had eight people in this church. And the others just kept laughing until that raindrop came. Until the rain came, they knocked on the window, they knocked on the door, asked, them, asked the brother Noah to get on board. Noah told the people, I'm sorry, my friend, and God got the key and you can't get in because you did not take heed to the, to the prophetic warning. Jesus tell them, when you see these signs, that's the time for you to drop everything and run for your life. That is your rapture. Get out the way of the wrath of God because it is judgment time because judgment starts in the house of the Lord. See that? All right, now. It says this, uh, verse 37, each day Jesus was teaching at the temple and each evening he went out to spend the night on the hill called the Mount of Olives and all the people came early in the morning to hear him at the temple. Now, I'm going to tell you something. The Pharisees, the scribes, uh, the religious leaders that ran the temple was already planning and plotting to murder him. Now, they got to murder him just right because they can't cause a riot. And they got to always make sure they can't murder him in front of the Romans because the Romans really only got the right to bring what you call execution. So they got to arrest Jesus in the right place away from the crowd because they don't want a riot to happen because they're always was concerned about you're going to take our uh, temple away from us and take away what you allow us to have. Because when Rome came in to put 
the Jews in bondage. They allowed the Jews to keep their religion and keep what they're doing. As long as you pay Rome their taxes and you don't riot and try to throw over the power of Rome, we'll let you be some nice good old slave boys and slave girls. As long as you pay us our taxes and keep us as number one and you acknowledge Caesar as Lord of all. Did you catch that? Because the name Caesar is a title for Lord of all or Son of God. It is the deified Caesar and that Rome was more powerful than Jerusalem and more powerful than anything the Jews can come up with. And then the Jews would say, send us a Messiah to deliver us from the hand of the Romans. But the problem Jesus had was, you need deliverance from yourselves. <laughs> he said, I'm not concerned about Rome. I'm concerned about the pharisaical leadership. I'm concerned about people murdering people inside the temple. I'm concerned about the love of money. You don't care whether you got a building fund, but the folks in your church are homeless. You got a building fund, but folks don't have jobs. You got a building fund, but you folks don't have college degrees. How do you have a building fund and your folks can't pay their rent? I don't understand that. It don't make no sense. So you got to understand there are things that goes on in this time that we can look at indirectly in today's time. Okay, now watch this. So, the temple was something not to mess with. Back up to, to Luke 19 and look at this. I'm gonna show I'm gonna show you something. Look at this. Luke 19. It says this. Um, verse 41. Let me just say this. As he approached Jerusalem. Now, now I already showed you the temple being torn out. Now I'm gonna show you he cried over Jerusalem. As he approached and saw the city, he cried over it. And he said, if you, even you, had only known on this day, not 2,000 years later, this day, what would bring you peace, you will be excited about my arrival. But since I know you guys are arrogant and you won't receive nothing that I'm saying to you, I know you're going to murder me, which is going to bring your final judgment on you in the city and the temple. But now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and trap you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls, within a woman's womb. They will not leave one stone on another. Why? Because you did not recognize the time of the Lord's visitation. And then right after that, look what Jesus does. He entered the temple area and began driving out those, watch this y'all, watch this, watch this, who were selling. It was written, he said, my house will be a house of prayer, but you made it a cave or a den of robbers. You can see this in Isaiah 56, 7, Jeremiah 7, verse 11. He's dealing with judgment of his own Jewish leadership because his fellow Jews wouldn't even embrace him. Look at verse 47. Look at it. And you got to read this, man. Stop ignoring topics in the Bible because it's uncomfortable to preach and talk about. Every day he was teaching in the temple, in the temple or at the temple, at the temple, at the temple. I think sometimes if he had stayed outside of the temple, it wouldn't have been a problem. But the Jews worshipped the temple. It attracted the most people. But the Jewish leadership was off, perverted, and twisted. So Jesus would show up in the same temple and preach a message that was contrary to the Jewish leadership that ran the temple. And so when they would hear him say things, they would say, oh, you got to go. We got to get rid of you. We don't like you. You got to go. But they would meet in groups and say, but he's the Messiah. That's who God sent. And they say, I don't care what God say. We're running this. We don't care who he is. And we don't, we don't want to embrace his visitation. So just because God sent you doesn't mean people embrace you. That's another trick we got. God can see you someplace and you still can be rejected. See, that's we think because God sent you, you're supposed to be embraced. There are times God would send you as a court evidence for witnessing. So when God brings judgment, God can say, I sent you a warrior. I sent you a papo. I sent you a cow. I sent you a Margie. I sent you a crystal. I sent you a tangent. And I gave you warning. 
There are times I sat in rooms with politicians and I warned them. I told them, if you pass certain laws, I'm going to tell you something you're going to be responsible for. And I warn you as a prophet of God. And I got to be kicked out of stuff. I don't get all the kudos everybody get. I understand that. I know my fingerprint and I'm confident. Don't bother me. Fine. But I'm telling you, some of y'all get depressed. They don't receive me. I don't get trophies. I don't get certificates. I don't have my name on the wall. I'll be like, please. <laughs> I'd rather have Christ honor me. Anything you put before Christ will eventually be torn down. And that's what's going on here. Verse 47. Every day he was teaching in the temple. But, look, but read this. Look. The chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the leaders amongst the Jews were trying to murder him. Now, I'm going to read this again for some of y'all who hate to offend people. Truth is the truth, man. I think sometimes... Even in our history books, we don't really tell you the truth about what happened to black African Americans that were sold into slavery. Back, it was captured, tricked to go on the ship, and they sold us out throughout all the world. And Brazil, we were the top commodity. The slavery we suffered in America was worse than the type of slavery Israel suffered under the hand of the Egyptian under the Egyptians in Exodus. Because at least they had a hometown to go back to. Uh, called Goshen had their own city. We'd have had nothing. They took the black man, scattered the, the black woman, sexed out the women, turned the dark skinned slave against the white skinned slave. Oh my God, we suffered some major stuff, but the grace of God brought us through. But I'm showing you something here that it's possible to be religious and still be murderous. Because you have a title, because you're a Christian. I'm a bishop. I'm a pastor. I'm a, so what does that mean? Anybody can wear a title. Oprah said, when someone shows you who they are, believe them. Look at verse 47. Every day he was teaching at the temple, but the chief priest, Jewish, teachers of the law, Jewish, and leaders, Jewish, amongst the Jews were trying to murder him. Yet, they could not find any way to do it. Because all the people hung on his words. All right now, now hold it. Because I, I'm trying to get to something. It seems like I'm, 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 I, I can't really get to it. But I got to show you this. What you see in Luke 20, 19, 20, 21, up to 21, uh, Jesus Christ is actually getting nails, nailed into his coffin as he's teaching. Because everything he do is is pushing the envelope to a quicker murder because he on his way out. Because these things Jesus is doing, I'm like saying to myself, oh my God, he calling they doodle out on the carpet. Man, he's nasty. All right, if you get to chapter 20, right, he tells them a story. Look at 29. And I got to say this because you got to get this. He went on to tell the people this parable. He says, a man planted a vineyard and rented it to some farmers and went away for a long time. At harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants, which are the Jewish leadership, so they would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard or the Gentiles, people looking for help. But the tenants beat him and sent him away uh, empty-handed. He sent another servant, but that one he also they beat and treated shamefully and sent away empty-handed. He then sent a third and they wounded him and threw him out. Verse 13, then the owner, which represents God the Father, the owner of the vineyard said, what shall I do? I will send my son whom I love. Perhaps they will receive him and embrace him and respect him. Verse 14, but when the tenants, this is the Jewish leadership that ran the temple, saw the son who is Christ Jesus, they had a meeting amongst themselves and they said, this is the heir. This is the heir. This is the heir. I'm not talking about this, the air I breathe. This is the air. This is the inheritance, which means we know he's the one. We know God sent him. We know Jesus is the Messiah. We already know it. We don't want to relinquish the power of the love of money and the power of control. Don't always feel that you're wrong when people reject you. It's just that you got so much truth that the lies can't take it. All right. This is the heir, they said, let us murder him, and what he has will become ours. 
So they threw Jesus out of the vineyard and they murdered him. He is prophesying his crucifixion. All right. Verse. Next verse is, what then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? <laughs> Look at verse 16. He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. Now, now I taught this before, but I'm summing, it, I'm summing it up so you can see what I'm saying is right or wrong. Okay? I'm going to read it again. Verse, uh, verse 15. So they threw Jesus out of the vineyard and they murdered him. That's crucifixion. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come, this is the Father God, and kill those tenants. One million died in the temple from 66 AD to 70 AD. One million at least died. It was the nastiest, bloodiest thing of all time. Jesus said it'd be the worst. There'd be none after worse than this. This was worse than even Hitler killing, killing six million Jews. And give the vineyard to others. Who are we going to give it to? To the Israel of God, to the ecclesia, to the ecclesia, to those Jews and Gentiles who call on the name of the Lord. And even those Jews who are still open and who say, Christ might be the Messiah. I don't know, but I'm seeking. Ah, that's what God likes. But the arrogant one, the one that knew that Christ was the Messiah, the one that knew that he was the bomb diggity, but purposely chose not to believe, called unbelief, that's the one Jesus says my father will kill and remove. Not all, some. When the Jews heard this, they said, may this never be. And then Jesus looked directly at them and asked, then what is the meaning of that which is written in your Old Testament? The stone that the builders rejected had become the chief cornerstone. Which means they were saying to Jesus, this is not going to happen. You, you're not going to do this. That's not going to happen. He said, you know the Old Testament. I am the chief cornerstone. When you reject me, I'm going to end up being the cornerstone that brings together the apostles and prophets to help build this body called the Ecclesia. So you can go on and reject me all you want. I'll still be a stone in the corner of the building. You know why I like this? What Jesus does, Monica Johnson and Tanya Fields and McCole and Jose? Because it means that rejection is promotion in reverse. Be very careful of the people you overlook and you think not important. Because wherever you go, they might end up in the same building you're going to, end up being your boss. <laughs> I don't like Jose. I don't like Carolyn Moody. I don't like Eric Custis. I don't I can't stand them. And they do you so wrong. They don't invite you to nothing. They don't help you. They dog you out. They gossip about you. And sooner or later, you end up being their boss. <laughs> So be very careful how you treat people because actually Cinderella is a story of promotion in reverse. Yeah, keep overlooking her. She's going to end up marrying the prince and become your boss. And when Jesus was saying, y'all go ahead and murder me, I'm coming back later. And I'm going to live inside of all these people who preach, blessed is him that comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus looked directly at them and asked them, what is the meaning of that which is in your Old Testament scripture of the Torah? The stone that the builder rejected had become the chief cornerstone or the capstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, but he on whom it falls will be crushed, which means that when you humble yourself and be broken before the Lord, I raise you up. But those of you who are planning and plotting my murder and trying to destroy me and you know the truth and won't yield to it, I will crush you. That don't sound real graceful. It don't sound like real nice. It doesn't sound like somebody's going to read on Facebook. Like, God love, God love, God love. No, not here. Judgment time. Know the difference. And even when God judges, you do it through love. Look at verse 19. The teachers of the law and the chief priests looking for a way to arrest him immediately. 2,000 years later for America. Got nothing to do with America. Immediately. Because they knew he has spoken this parable against them. But they were afraid 
of the people. Now let me get to close this thing. Okay, I started at 10.05. I got two minutes. I'll be done at 11.05. I close out this uh, thing. I misinterpreted the scripture because there's much to cover. And the next teaching I'm going to do, I'm going to do more on, uh, I'm going to deal with this term called the rapture. And I'm not doing this to try to sound uh, uh, disrespectful, but the rapture teaching has done a great damage to the body of Christ because we have an, an escape is a mentality, but not a kingdom advancing mentality. When you really have the kingdom flowing through you, Eric and Eduardo and Monica, you don't look for opportunities to run from evil. You take the kingdom gospel and stamp out evil. Church folks are the only folk I know will leave the earth and turn the earth over everybody when the Bible says that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and the meek inherit the earth. I mean, the earth belongs to Pastor McDuffie and my bloodline. But if you've been taught to escape and run, you don't read the scriptures. Listen, I got to go. Thank you for watching the AA level. Thank you. That's going to be it for tonight. I can't do two hours. I apologize. I have to do the BA tomorrow. But I thank God for the AA level. Those that love this, please go to the Cash app. Uh, tuition payers. If you watch me tonight, I think it'd be quite respectful to go to the cash app and sow a seed or an offering tonight. Some of you can sow 20, some can sow 100. Uh, whatever you got lays in your heart, I pray that the seed soars and the tuition payers may the Lord bless. Thank you, President CBJ. Please post the application again. This is, of course, week 101, lesson 20. I misinterpreted the scripture. I close out this topic. And I'm going to do another topic and I'm going to come back to the rapture. I'm going to do something a little bit different and come back to the rapture. And we're getting close to 120 hours of the AA level. And I'm working on the BA level. I'll do BA tomorrow and I try to do a couple. Okay? Love y'all. God bless you. Thank you for watching.